Good morning. Good morning. What a lovely sunny autumnal day again. How are you? I hope you're well. Oh, it's going to be sunny again. Now, I've got something exciting for you on the agenda today. Because, oh, hang on. Excuse my PPE. <sighs> There we are. Who said you could only use a mask once? Oh. I'm going to turn. I'm going to peep and creep, peep and creep. That's it. I'm going to turn with the sun on our backs. So that is, uh, might mean we're going down the wiggly bends, mightn't it? But as we know, the wiggly bends are shut. Head closed. So we're going to go a third way, an alternative, alternative way. We're going to go down Preston Hill and into Wingham and then turn left and then go up the dual carriageway to join it before we normally join it. If we go, if we turn left out of the house, you don't need to know all this. Ah! What the hell's that? Oh. Oh, it's a torch. I decided it would be a good idea to have a torch in the car. So. Right. Rubbish torch. Lying around for ages. When I finally got some uh, batteries. It takes those massive great batteries, you know. Big old. The batteries that were the only type of battery when when I was a boy. And it takes three of those. But it's got um, LED, so presumably it lasts a lifetime, you know, on three batteries. Hopefully I won't need it. But I thought to myself, I've got some torches around the house. And the one place I haven't really got a torch, other than the one on my phone, is um, is in the car. So And that might be when you really need it, mind you. I might you might come across something that needs illumination. Can you see the road closed signs going the other way? So diverted traffic, that's me. I've been diverted. Here we go. So having just come down the hill, we're gonna go back up the hill. I love this car. It's a Peugeot partner. And while I, you know, have a grudging admiration for certain things French, cheese and wine, for example, perhaps wine more than cheese. So I do like English cheese. But uh, cars, French cars, I found are pretty, pretty good. On the left here, you'll see Wingham Wildlife Park, which is a wildlife park. And start, they always start off with a couple of birds, you know, an owl or something. Then they add a vulture, and then before you know it, it's got uh, lions and penguins and a very nice little park. If you're ever in the area, very informal, very human-sized type, very well kept, a bit like um, the sort of park that you'd create for yourself, you know, if you were playing uh, Sim Park, Sim Wildlife Park. Yeah, so uh, what should we talk about today? I could give you an update on the old Bitcoin situation because I have done some Bitcoin briefings in the past. I know they're not for everyone. I know some people will turn off now and say that's a Ponzi scheme or whatever, or the government's going to ban it or everything that everyone's been saying since 2008, um, which is fine. It's fine. You have to be ready for Bitcoin. You have to be uh, in a mood and you have to have the brains to be quite honest. You have to have the brains to understand it. Some people will never get into Bitcoin in the same way as I'll never get into trading futures or, uh, contracts are difference because I just don't understand them and what I do know about them I don't like 
So that's fine. So if you don't like Bitcoin or you're not interested in my opinion on Bitcoin, then fine, then turn off them. But uh, Bitcoin is the, the big headline, of course, is that Bitcoin was at 60,000 something dollars and it's now at $16,000, which has led to a certain amount of gratuitous smugness amongst the people who uh, haven't got any. <laughs> but uh, has not bothered at all the people who bought Bitcoin when they were like $300 and have still got some at $16,000 and therefore it's the battle of the smugnesses. That's where we normally come out. So, and uh, you know, of course uh, I've sort of followed Bitcoin and the macroeconomics. Um, I do get the occasional person ring up and say, I've got some Bitcoin, should I sell them now? Are they gonna go down to nothing, etc.? Have they got no intrinsic value? That's the big question. And uh, I always say to them that buying things high and selling them low it's not a brilliant tra uh, trading strategy, in my opinion. There we are. That's got the windscreen cleared off a bit. So I tell people just to sit on them, you know. And I can do that because it's not financial advice because I don't get paid for it. And apparently you can tell people to do all sorts of stupid things. Provided you don't get paid for them, then it's up to them to take your advice or not, isn't it? But as soon as you start charging for the advice, then you become a, a financial advisor and then you have to start uh, taking exams and and uh, start to get judged by uh, against the conventional orthodoxy. Oh, there comes the sun. So, look at that, look at that road. Can you believe that road? Isn't that not a lovely clear road? At 814. Who says that petrol at 190 a gallon, a litre, 190 a litre is uh, not uh, reducing the traffic? I reckon he is. So, this just, I'm just going to very, very quickly set the scene for this because obviously, if you don't know the base from which I'm coming or, or the, the, you know, the, the old shibboleths from which I'm, well, no, it's not a shibboleth, is it? Shibboleth is a load of bunkum. And uh, well, I don't know what a load of bunkum is, but it's obviously a shibboleth. But, uh, you know, the, the, the tenets of the tenets of my belief. And uh, broadly speaking, in 2008, someone wrote a paper, which was a breakthrough in computer um, computer systems. Uh, what's the word? Anyway, it's a breakthrough in proof, um, and it proved that um, you can have a, a digital file which can be unique. Now, those of us brought up on Tomorrow's World who were told that the great thing about digital files is that they can be copied ad infinitum with no loss of quality, and that it would be uh, they are indistinguishable. In other words, you couldn't tell which was the original, which was the fifth generation copy. This will have come as a great uh, surprise. Um, but by virtue of these um, files being registered on a, a, a network, a, a decentralized but, but, uh, global network, that um, it was possible to say which was the original digital file, uh, mainly because it would ha have a digital signature that can't be reproduced. And the person who owned the key to the digital uh, lock is regarded as the um, person who's got beneficial ownership of the Bitcoin. Although they don't necessarily take possession of it, the Bitcoins are always in cyberspace, but who owns them is, is very much uh, fixed, as is the number. Now, this obviously uh, solved one of the major problems with digital money, which is that if it's digital, you can copy it. And if you can spend it faster than the person you've copied it off, then it's very difficult without having some sort of centralized authority to know who's actually got the real money. Yep, yeah, I'm waiting for you. I'm waiting for you. There we go, second gear. 
So that's really what put the brakes on digital money was the fact that uh, uh, you needed a, a third party to say who owned what. And really, a lot of people, myself included, were not very happy with that approach. Um, not least because, uh, you know, hacking and... Uh, but because this uh, third party risk, because they might go bust or more likely, they'll just get compromised by the American government. And, you know, you'll find that you, you thought you owned some money and you didn't. So the decentralized nature of Bitcoin and the fact that it's uh, un unhackable has um, made it attractive and made it useful as money. Now, uh, the theory, my theory of value is that anything is valuable if it's useful and scarce. So uh, just uh, if you like, just pause the video and just think of a few things that you find valuable and think a few things that you don't find valuable and um, see if that holds true. Are they, is their value derived by their usefulness and their scarcity? Those two properties alone. I'll wait while you do that. Okay, have you done that? So you'll find that, if, let's say you take gold, for example, gold is useful because it's got useful properties and it's scarce because it's mined and mining takes energy and it's, there's only a certain amount of gold. So that's what gives it its value. Uh, grass is uh, somewhat useful, uh, you know, especially if you're playing football, you'd like a nice grass football pitch, but, but it's not at all scarce. So you can't really sell grass. There are other things which are uh, not at all useful, but scarce, like the bogeys up my nose. But again, they're not valuable because they they may be scarce, but they're not useful. Um, and so this is the formula. Whenever you're evaluating something, ask yourself, is it useful? How useful is it? And how scarce is it? Now, if you apply the uh, same rules to money, you'll find that money is valuable Therefore, it must have some utility and some scarcity. Um, and of course, it's useful because uh, the government demands money in exchange uh, in tax. So the government, the fact that the government will only accept money in exchange for tax, tax bills means that it, you have to have some. So it's useful to that in that respect, in that it's it's useful to stop uh, the inland revenue or, or the you know or the police knocking on your door and arresting you with a magistrate's warrant and carting you off to jail because you haven't paid your, your, your income tax or whatever and it's that use you know that use to to avoid state-sponsored violence and uh, <laughs> incarceration that means that it has generally has value and you know if i stop and pay for petrol the petrol station will want money off me because the, they will want money themselves to pay their tax. So, but that's the only use that it has. I mean, I don't think, I can't think of any other use for money other than, um, you know, the fact that it, the government demands that you pay all your liabilities in it. It's, um, it's the universal, what do they call it? The, um, It's the uh, oh, it's generally it's generally accepted uh, by courts. So um, if you, um, I don't know what my brain's doing this morning. Must be the fact I've come a different way. Perhaps I've gone through a portal and it's not my IQ back out twenty points or so. It's um. So. Money is money is valuable to that extent that and other people accept it, and and you'll sometimes you'll hear people say, well, money's only it's a, it's an illusion, it's like a mass uh, hypnosis, and that we all only think money's valuable because everybody else thinks money is valuable, and when we all decide that money's not valuable, then it won't be valuable, um, and that's you know like everything else, it's sort of a half truth. Money will continue to be valuable all the time it's useful and scarce. Now, the reason why people are asking for more money for uh, their houses and for their commodities and for their wages is because it has become much less scarce. The government has created a lot of money out of thin air 
So people see that and they want more money for their uh, for their assets, their houses and stuff. Um, and its utility hasn't really changed much. It's still only used as um, in payments of uh, debts. Legal tender is the word I'm looking for. It's legal tender. Well, legal tender doesn't mean that uh, a shopkeeper has to accept it, but it means that, that so for example, suppose you go in a shop and or, or suppose you're going to a restaurant, that's a better example, and you have a meal, it costs 100 quid, and you say to them, do you take cash? And they say, no, we don't take cash. Uh, we only take credit cards. And you say, well, I can't pay on credit card. It's run up my, I don't have one, or I don't have it with me, or I don't have a bank account or whatever, but I've got 100 pound cash. And they say, well, we don't take cash. So then what happens is you leave your name and address with the restaurant because that's a civil liability. It's a civil debt. And then what will happen is they will then uh, issue a, a claim in the small claims court against you for the money. And you can then take your hundred pounds down the court and pay a hundred pounds into the court plus another eight quid or whatever for their solicitors, the their, their cost of issuing the summons. Um, and um, and the court will accept the cash because that's it. it's it's legal tender. In other words, you can tender cash in settlement of any debt, any legal debt, and a, and a debt to a court is obviously a legal debt. So if the restaurant doesn't accept it, then the court will, and they, the restaurant will still get their cash. But they'll, you know, they'll have to wait a month or two and uh, look up how to make a money claim online and all that sort of thing. So. So you don't really, most people don't really want to do that. So what they do is they tend to patronise uh, companies that uh, will accept cash. If they want to pay in cash, they, they patronise companies that will accept cash. And <clears throat> you might think, oh, well, who pays with cash these days? Everyone's got like a tap and pay card. Everyone's got a tap and pay wallet. Um, but... Uh, we went to a restaurant the other day, and uh, I took, took the uh, staff out for lunch, and um, they said on the menu, um, no cash. Cards only, no cash. And and I had a card anyway, so it didn't matter. But I went to the, um, the till to pay, and I said, what's all this about you not taking cash? And he said, well, um, you know, it means that we have to keep afloat and give change. He said, but we will take cash if... If we've got the right change, then we're very happy to take cash. And I'm like, really, you know, that's not actually the message that's given, is it, by the message no cash on the menu. No cash equals no cash. It doesn't say no cash. Or it doesn't say, you know, no. You know, when you try and pay cash, they might say, well, I'm sorry, I haven't got the right change. Can you pay by card or something? That'd be much more friendly. Anyway, so so that's my theory of uh, value, utility and scarcity. And um, now, FTX was a big exchange that was run by some sort of man boy called Sam Bankman Freed, and he basically got in over his head, like a like that other fat American twat who ran. Uh, Mount Gox, Mark Carpellez, they all seem to be like really pasty, doughy, American 20-year-olds who for some reason have, have got, they haven't got the brains to stay away from something that's going to blow up in their faces. And so they, and this whole thing snowballs until their company's worth billions of dollars because everybody's chasing the uh, reward including the people who put their coins on the exchange and they're told that they're going to get like a risk-free four percent reward or whatever and then uh, it all blows up and everybody loses their money now the um, conventional wisdom is to say well that, that's because there's no regulation it's the wild west and uh, as soon as the government gets involved then they'll come up with a deposit protection scheme and everyone will get their money back but in fact the real Bitcoin purists like myself, the OGs, would say, and we come into a lot of criticism for saying this, that that's, this is the way the market works. You don't do your due diligence and you put your market, you put your money in a, in a firm which is um, 
you know, taking risks with it and expecting a risk-free 4% reward, which any idiot will tell you that you can't get, and um, and you end up losing your money. And you learn a lesson. And if you're a big uh, VT firm, like BlackRock or someone, then then it's a £200 million lesson. And that's it's your own stupid fault. Here we go. It's bloody junction again. Look, that van. That van's going to go straight on. That van's going to go straight on. Just because they're van drivers and they've got no, uh, you know, they don't, they don't care about how things work. There he goes. Let's put the old. Uh, Spanner amongst the pigeons by blocking the lane up. Now we've got we've got someone behind us. Oh, we've got two vans behind us now. They're not going to be happy. Now the question is, can I get back in the traffic? Anyway, a lot of people have, um, seriously, you're not going to let me in. Oh, well, I don't believe it. Anyway, um, yeah, so, uh, but but Bitcoin itself, really, Bitcoin itself is unaffected. What it's done is it's not a confidence in, in Bitcoin ecosystem. People, are, but, but, you know, from my point of view, the original Bitcoiners were libertarians. They came into it because it was a peer-to-peer -peer cash system. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't an investment. It hadn't been classified as a, as a commodity at that point, or, or a, an asset, it was, a, it was a monetary good. And the whole point was for everybody to use it peer to peer. Now, in the end, that um, that uh, ability was subverted in the original Bitcoin BTC, and it then became more like Fedwire, which is a way of wiring money from one large entity to another. Uh, and and there, another, there was a spin-off called Bitcoin Cash, which is the one that you can use as cash, peer-to-peer -peer cash, if you want to, with, with sort of very instant uh, on-chain transactions and very, very low transaction fee. Very much like the original... Um... Yeah, go on, go on. Oh, uh... Okay, indecision. Not prepared for it, you see. Come flying out there, but didn't expect to go flying out onto the main road. So therefore, you know, didn't know what to do. So then you get all this influx of people who come in thinking, oh, it's an asset. It's a get rich quick scheme. It's a, it's a, it's a way to speculate and, and basically gamble. And this is one of the major problems with the human race. Is our propensity to gamble, or the propensity for many of us to gamble. And I'm sure there's a reason for it. But um, stock markets are basically a gamble. You know, they're just, people think they're not, but it's basically just two people, both who think that they know what, what's going to happen in the future better than the other one. And that's just gambling. I mean, I know you think it's a considered risk and that you've considered it all very carefully and everything, but all you've done is you've considered it very carefully and the other bloke's considered it very carefully and you've come to different opinions and so you put a bet on who's right. And all these people that have come into Bitcoin sensing that the, the big bucks might be made by gambling in the Bitcoin arena are getting flushed out, including all the people who put their money on FTX expecting a risk-free 4% um, return. So we don't really have too much sympathy with them. And in the meantime, the Bitcoin network is still working fine and 
the use cases for Bitcoin are still the same and the Bitcoin network still churning Bitcoins out one every, you know, not one, but, but every 10 minutes, a new block every 10 minutes. So um, really, you know, it's no, no one's got too much sympathy for anyone and no one's selling their Bitcoins. Nobody really knows what's going on is selling their Bitcoins. And um, because we're in between halving cycles, anyone who, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to recommend you buy any. I'm not going to recommend you because I'll tell you why. Let me tell you why. When people buy Bitcoins, if they have Bitcoins end up being worth less than they pay for them, they give me GPH of the euro for years, years. And then all of a sudden their Bitcoins are worth more than they bought them for and all they shut up. They never say, oh, you know, Thank God you bored me silly about Bitcoin because I've made a bit of money on it. But when they've lost a bit of money on it, they they never stop. So don't, I'm not going to tell you to buy Bitcoin because I don't want you to buy at 16,000. Then it goes down to 12 and then, and then it goes up to 250 and no one's going to say thank you very much, are they? No one. So why should I bother? Anyway, okay. Well, it's been a nice 20 minutes. I'll talk to you sometime. Bye.